Vitek is no tragic hero, and I for one struggle to see him as any kind of dark hero, and maybe you'll feel different about this. But for me, there is little in him that is heroic or admirable. For instance, we may be told early on that he admires knowledge, but we're also told that this is circumscribed by his refusal to debate with scholars out of vanity, you know, in case they show him up. And it's all kind of downhill from there. There aren't any really positive attributes about Vatek at all. Vatek embarks on a Faustian trajectory in which the Jower takes the role of Mephistopheles, but unlike Faustus' journey, Vatek's trajectory is characterised by blundering and stupidity. Vatek is attracted to the Jower at first by shiny things, and unlike Faustus, he never seems to understand what he's in for. He's told he'll end up in the Palace of Subterranean Fires. This sounds awfully like hell to me, but Vatek is undaunted. He never seems to notice that the Jower is stringing him along, constantly seeming to change his demands and add new conditions. Vatek is easily frustrated, enraged and baffled, and is often distracted by sexual lust and his other appetites. In short, Vitek looks like easy fodder for any reasonably efficient demon. The more interesting and ambiguous character, perhaps, is Karatus, Vitek's mother. So the story has two characters impelling Vitek to evil. We first encounter Karatus, where she displays maternal behaviour, calming Vitek with tears and caresses. But she reveals herself as femme fatale, urging Vitek on in his evil actions. A striking aspect of Karatus' wickedness is that much of her service to the Jower is her own innovation. Uh, no one is telling her to do it. it. It hasn't been decreed as part of the arrangement. She's just thinking of new disgusting things that will delight the infernal powers. For instance, think of the hideous burnt offerings of Egyptian mummies and other things that Karatus offers on top of the tower. Then, 140 local concerned citizens turn up thinking the tower is alight and they offer to help to put it out, and Karatus adds them to the fire as well. Finally, Karatus burns Samara out of spite, uh, knowing full well she can't go back there. Perhaps ultimately, though, she is not as clever as she thinks. She tries to pay obsequious devotions to Eblis, but nonetheless, Karatus is the first main character we see reduced to the state of eternal zombification. So, in what light does Beckford expect us to view this final destruction of all the main characters? He does leave us with a moral. Such was, and such should be, the punishment of unrestrained passions and atrocious actions. Such is, and such should be, the chastisement of blind ambition, that would transgress those bounds which the Creator had prescribed to human knowledge, and by aiming at discoveries reserved for pure intelligence, acquire that infatuated pride which perceives not that the condition appointed to man is to be ignorant and humble. Thus the Caliph Vathek, who for the sake of empty pomp and forbidden power had sullied himself with a thousand crimes, became a prey to grief without end, and remorse without mitigation. Does he mean it, or has he just put in the lesson that an 18th century reader expects? It's up to you to decide whether Beckford is sincere, or whether he is paying lip service to the idea that literature should educate. As to his overall motivations for the book, while we should be careful about reading fictional works as biographical, we can't overlook Beckford's suggestions that Vitek is self-caricatural, uh, sending up both himself and indeed his formidable mother. Beckford does report that the book was inspired by an exotic party they held. Fabulously wealthy, Beckford built his own tower or Gothic mansion. And in another weird parallel with art, 
or perhaps a strange turn of prophecy, some decades after the tech was published, Beckford's own tower burned to the ground.